Love helping your clients but hate sales and marketing, but somehow you ended up with sales and marketing responsibilities, then this is the podcast for you. Hi, Chief Nerd Ruben Swartz here. I spent a long time learning these lessons the hard way, and I want to help you learn them the easy way by sharing my experiences and talking with brilliant people who have figured out how to hack not just the code, but the sales and marketing process as well. Of course, as a nerdy person who hated struggling with complex CRMs, I had to create my own CRM for people who actually hate selling, which sounds like an oxymoron, but if it sounds interesting to you, check it out at Mimarin.com. That's M-I-M-I-R-A-N.com. And whether or not you need a new CRM, you'll find proposal templates and sample lead magnets to help you grow your business. This summer, we also got an awesome giveaway going on. Signed books by amazing Sales for Nerds guests like Aaron Ross, Scott Ingram, Mara Thomas, Joy Beatty, Justin Foster, John Livesey, Vanessa Van Edwards, and Rusty Shelton. Plus, you'll get a free enrollment in my online course on sales proposals. Now, I do most of my reading on a Kindle, but there's something really nice about having a real book signed by the author in your hands. Register to win at salesfornerds.io and get more chances to win by referring your friends. Plus, with a bookshelf this big, you can share with your friends. You can't read them all at the same time anyway. Now let's get to it. Today, I'm excited to have Laura Briggs on Sales for Nerds. She is a former middle school teacher, I kid you not, a successful freelance SEO writer, and now the author of Start Your Own Freelance Writing Business with Entrepreneur Press, which is coming out in a month or so. Um, And she's also done a couple of TEDx talks on freelancing. So Laura, welcome to Sales for Nerds. Hey, thanks for having me. Excited to chat with you. Awesome. What do you have in your glass? I, I've cheated a little bit because I know some people would not think that sangria counts as wine, but to me, it's the best form of wine. So I'm going with my red sangria. Awesome. Well, and I don't know whether it's cheating or not, but it's starting to get really hot here in Texas. And the hotter it gets, the more leeway I'm willing to give people on what <laughs> constitutes wine or whatever you want to imbibe. Awesome. I love it. So how did you go from middle school teacher to SEO writer? Well, I burned out and it was a combination of me being exhausted with the idea of teaching. And also there were some parts of my teaching job that I was really, really bad at. So I was really good at creativity, creating lesson plans, coming up with innovative ways for the kids to learn things. I was terrible at classroom management. Like it was just a battle I could not fight. So I would not have that perfect, quiet classroom with every student sitting in their seat. I had 35 kids in my classroom at a time and we didn't even have enough desks. So I chose to let that battle go. Uh, The administration did not love that. They really wanted kids all sitting quietly working on something. And it was like... It was just not something that was really my strength. So I started thinking of other ways that I could use skills I might have where I wouldn't have to, say, go back to school and learn something new. And I thought, okay, my strength here is creating lesson plans, writing, helping the kids learn to read and improve their writing. Maybe there's something that I can do with my own writing skills. So I started part-time and then kept at it for a little over a year and then went full-time into freelance SEO writing. And I, I started as a freelance writer. I didn't know that I was going to go with SEO. I just sort of slipped into that and saw that there was a lot of a demand for it. So that's why I stuck with that particularly. All right. And I want to get really deep into that, but I want to go back to what you said, which has nothing to do with the rest of our conversation, but it just strikes me as interesting. You didn't have enough desks for all the kids, but the administration was upset that the kids weren't sitting at their desks. Did I hear that right? Yeah, we also did not have enough books. I did not have a computer, a projector. They, The school would not even buy pencils or chalk or paper or anything. I had to supply it all. So it was very a very odd atmosphere because there were like a lot of things that I saw that were wrong as far as how the administration managed things and ways that we could do things better. But it's not really a battle that an individual teacher can fight. Um, I was even asked to teach three years worth of social studies material in one because the school could not afford a sixth or an eighth grade teacher. So seventh (laughs) grade was it. And the principal was like, whatever you think they need to know between fifth grade and high school, teach them. So I didn't even have like a set curriculum either. It was total chaos for a first year teacher. (laughs) Well, it's a good thing that middle schoolers just are so calm and mature and collected and understanding, right? 
it, yeah, right. It, and that was the other thing too, about keeping kids in their seats. I'm like, they're 12. Like it's just not, it's not really an option when they're at that age. So my mentality was if they're up and moving around from stations, going from one section of the room to the other, but they're learning to me, that's more effective than saying like, here's a packet of work, fill it out in silence by the end of our 70 minutes together. So just a difference in teaching methodologies there, but it became increasingly clear that it just wasn't the right environment for me. Now, did handling this room full of seventh graders give you any insight or expertise or emotional strength to handle uh, freelance clients? Oh, absolutely. I think that one of my greatest strengths as a freelancer is boundaries, negotiation, dealing with difficult conversations with clients. And I think a lot of that does have to do with my teaching background. I was even teaching a live freelance writing course a couple of months ago, and there were 13 people in the room, all adults. And one of the guys asked me, are you nervous? And I said, I used to stand in front of a room of 35 wound up 12 year olds like you cannot scare me. All right, we're good to go. (laughs) Awesome. So let's get into SEO because I feel like this is a topic that everyone kind of hears about it and thinks, gosh, it would be great if I could do that. But it's so complicated. And most of us have gotten pitched by so many snake oil salesmen around SEO that everyone's a little bit jaded. How should people even start wrapping their minds around what SEO means and what should they be thinking about? I think the biggest misconception is that it's so complicated that you have to outsource this to someone or some agency that you pay thousands of dollars a month to. Many businesses don't want to do that and don't have enough knowledge with SEO to be able to sort of spot check an agency's work. And the good news is you don't have to do that. So even if you're not an expert in SEO, there are certain things that you can do that will help your website rank more effectively. You don't have to be an expert level SEO ninja to be able to see some of the returns and to accomplish some of your goals. So I think a lot of people shut themselves out before they even have the opportunity to succeed because they're like, that's too difficult and or I can't afford to pay someone to do it. Absolutely. So let's assume that that they have now listened to this point and they're no longer thinking, gosh, there's no way I can do this. I want to do this. What should they do first? I think the very first thing that you should do is determine the most relevant keywords for your business and industry. For people that are, let's say a plumber, you're going to also want to include local geographical tags. So if you're in Dallas, Texas, you're going to use variations of the word Dallas, the county area, perhaps popular neighborhoods, in addition to some of the keywords that would come up most frequently with someone seeking a plumber. Now, if you're a national business or someone who does business with people all over the country or all over the world, your keywords may or may not include that local aspect. But if you already have a website, kind of seeing, you know, what is it that your potential customers are searching for? What are the words they are using to describe the type of problems that you solve? So even if you already have content on your website, but it's not doing well, seeing how you could tweak and edit that would probably be a first place to start. Now, where would people go to find that information? So one of my favorite free tools is by Neil Patel, and it's called Uber Suggest. And it will give you information about different keywords, variations of that keyword, how competitive it would be to rank successfully for that keyword, and the overall perceived difficulty of someone entering into content marketing. Another free tool that I also like using is YouTube, because if you start typing in the search bar, something that you think would describe your business, it will drop down and show you what other people who have started typing that have been looking for. So you can start to get a sense of how your potential clients actually search for things, what kind of things they're looking for, the terms that they use. It could be different than perhaps the terminology that you use. So again, there's that you don't have to invest thousands of dollars or pay for a search engine tool. As a getting started point, start with your free places first. It's funny, right before we, we started, I closed out all my browser windows to, to minimize the bandwidth, but I had Uber Suggest open in one of those tabs. <laughs> now, there you go, perfect. Th- that YouTube hack, I had no idea about that. Super clever. Um, now, I think one of the things that, p- that people have trouble with, and I see it kind of more downstream when I work with them on their sites and their proposals and so on, people tend to get kind of wrapped up in what it is they think they're selling, which may be different, as you said, 
from what people think they're buying or what they're searching for. So if you're not really sure what people are searching for, how do you know, how do you kind of break out of that box that you're living in and understand the world from the, the visitor's side? I think everyone who's running a business has had some type of in-person or chat or email communication with their prospective clients. So what are the words that those people are using? When people show up in your you know, physical office or when you're on a sales call with them, what do they often describe as their biggest problems? What are the words that they use to describe why they ended up in your office? You can start speaking from their perspective when you have a better understanding of how they describe their issues. You know, what was the pain point that led them to to finally pick up the phone or to schedule a meeting with somebody? Because you can tap into that, not just for SEO purposes, but psychologically, because they're probably like a lot of your other customers. So what was, you know, the tipping point, you know, to go back to that plumber example, they might have actually been searching for a way to fix their spraying sink on their own. And maybe they watched a YouTube video and weren't able to fix it. So their pain point is they want someone who's just going to be a professional and do it as quickly as possible and be able to get to their house immediately. So you can use those types of ways that people speak about their own experiences or what it is that prompts them to end up even asking about working with you to help sort of turn that around and and create meaningful content on your website. That's a great point. And I think it, it sort of goes back to this notion of The online and the offline worlds aren't completely separate. There's people in both of them and you can Mm -hmm. use one to inform the other. And I try to ask when people say, oh, I found you via Google. I was like, well, what did you search for? No one ever remembers what they Mm -hmm. actually searched for, but I can have a pretty good guess about it based on the rest of our conversation and what they told me what they were trying to fix. And you can get so much other helpful information from even even people who don't hire you, your prospective customers will tell you, I clicked or I scheduled the call with you because of so-and-so's testimonial or because that case study you had on your homepage, it described exactly what I'm going through. So sometimes it can be a surprise to us what it is that sells other people on taking that step to reach out and communicate. But that's really helpful information to know regardless. I think it's a great point also about, well, some people may not end up buying from you. And sometimes Mm -hmm. that's just a statistical thing. And sometimes it's the way you're messaging people is actually maybe attracting some folks who aren't a good fit. And if you can figure out who those folks are, uh, I believe there's something called negative keywords or something that I'm hoping you're going to explain to me, uh, where you can kind of try to exclude people who at first blush would be in your market, but have some other disqualifying characteristic. Yeah, I think you can use both the keywords that your intended audience would speak with and also ways to disqualify people. I, I, In fact, I think that disqualifying people can be just as valuable because you can explain to them, you know, this is not worth your time to stay on this website. This is not worth your time to schedule a phone call with me. So a lot of times I will put when I'm trying to sort of draw people in, I will say, this describes who I'm hoping to help. And then I'll have like some bullet points and I'll say, this is not for you if, and it very clearly helps people sort out whether or not they really fit into that qualification category. Yeah, that's a great point. And there's no point in wasting time on both sides for something that you know is not going to go anywhere when you could actually help them by sending them to the right place. Yeah, exactly. And I think regardless of whether or not they ever work with you, it still builds credibility because you're willing to go there and say, hey, every person who lands on my website or on my Facebook page or wherever is not the right person to work with me. You might be in the future or you might have a friend who you're going to refer to me. That's happened to me before too, where someone reaches out to me and says, hey, so-and-so referred uh, you. And I'm like, who is that person? I never worked with them. It's because we had a conversation and I was up front or they were up front and saying it wasn't a fit, but they can still pass on your name in other ways. So I think it helps to be genuine and clear. And especially when someone is searching the internet for a solution to a problem, you don't want to waste their time. So I think it's respectful to say, you know, within five minutes, are you in the right place or not? Or within five minutes on the call, am I the right person to help you? It shows that you respect people's time. And if you can send them somewhere to somebody that you trust, who's going to take care of them, that's a win-win for for both of those people. And also sort of helps build that notion that maybe if there's a, a converse situation where someone's a better fit for you than that other person, maybe they'll end up referring somebody over to you. 
Exactly. So it's sort of like getting the most out of your content marketing across the board because you're laser targeted on the people who are a fit for you. And you're also building this sort of network of potential referrals as well. Okay. So we're going to do some research here via Uber Suggest and via YouTube and via going back through our conversation notes and kind of figure out what keywords should we be dealing with. Now, when it comes to this, how many keywords or key phrases should we be thinking about? Is this one? Is it 10? Is it, I've heard stories of larger companies, right? They have hundreds or thousands of keywords that they're, they're watching. What's a reasonable place for somebody starting out to start? I think if you're going to have a page that has a tremendous amount of text on it, then you might focus on one primary keyword and then some other secondary keywords. In general, for each page of your website, you want to be focused on one particular keyword. So when we're talking about static pages, you want which are those that you're not going to update. So that's kind of almost everything except a blog. What are the most important singular keywords that you intend to rank for on those pages? And then when you're looking to create a content marketing plan, like using a blog, you're still going to have one primary keyword per blog, but they're going to be different every single time that you post. And you might switch it up depending on how frequently you're posting as well. Um, But that's a great place to start. So when you say a singular keyword, does that mean one word or can it be a group of words and a phrase? I actually don't recommend one word. So when I say singular keyword, I'm talking about one term or phrase that we're going to target multiple times about once every 100 words in whatever you're creating. That's a way of speaking your customer's language, but also telling the search engines, hey, my website or this particular page is about this keyword. Please recognize that I have written high quality content that answers questions that someone searching this phrase would have, and therefore you should rank my website. So keywords that have multiple words within that phrase are actually called long tail keywords. They're much easier to rank for, right? If I was going to start a new sneaker company and I wanted to rank for the term tennis shoe or sneaker, I'm probably not going to ever compete with the big players like Nike and Reebok and New Balance and all of that. So I could probably never attain their level without massive amounts of content marketing that would be expensive and time consuming. But perhaps I can rank for other more relevant keywords like best tennis shoe for runners, best tennis shoe for half marathoners. So I'm writing a very specific page that's addressed to one person's clear need. And I'm targeting that phrase multiple times within there. So you don't say freelance or freelance writing. You're like, how to start a freelance writing business and quit your teaching job. Yes. So you can have a title as long as you want. Usually your keyword is going to be three to six words together. So so mine, so that, that example, it might be like freelance writing jobs on Upwork. That might be what my target audience is looking for. If they're looking for help on how to build their freelance business using that particular website. So I would write a blog that says, how can I get freelance writing jobs on Upwork or fastest way to win freelance writing jobs on Upwork? And then I target that phrase in my subsections within the piece in the first 100 words and in the last 100 words as well. Now, how do you know uh, if you're stuffing the keyword in too much and it looks like one of those spammy pages, is it just a matter of if this doesn't read right to me as a human, it's not right? So about... 500 words, give or take on your font size on your computer, is about one page worth of content inside Microsoft Word or something like that. So once every 100 words is a really good guideline. Now, most people aren't going to be counting every 100 words, right? So if you have about a page of content and you want to make sure you haven't done too much, I do, you know, Command F or Control F, and then you can see how many times you mentioned a particular phrase. So if you have it in there 10 times in only one page of content, that's probably too much. You know, Google might consider that keyword stuffing. So once every 100 words is pretty good. And, you know, sometimes you'll find people across the board who use a little more, who use a little less. It really just depends. But that's a great guideline to start with. And I guess it probably depends on exactly what the phrase is and how natural it is for it to repeat itself in the content. Right. And that's the most important thing. Of course, we want to send a signal to Google and other search engines about what the page is about by using keywords. But we also don't want to turn off the readers who have landed on our page. So even if I have something that is 
2000 words, I might not want to mention that keyword once every 100 words, it might not fit, it might feel overused, or the person might read it and say, this doesn't really sound natural, looks like they just wrote this page for the purpose of ranking in the search engine. So I'm going to click away and I don't want that. So the most important thing is that we have content that is directed to the end reader and is helpful to them. Okay. Now, how many different things should we be targeting? You mentioned basically we're going to do one keyword, which is really a key phrase per page, whether it's a blog post or a static page. But do we just do one and focus on that? Or do we need to have like three or 10 different pages slash posts to target slight variations of that key phrase? I would only do variations if they're helpful or describing something that is different. So like substantially different because you don't want it to seem like you're overdoing it. So a great chance to accomplish additional uses of your keyword in a natural way is to have a page of resources or a page of frequently asked questions, because that's a great place to use some of those variations of those keywords without saying like, Hey, here's a, you know, piece on freelance writing jobs on Upwork. And then here's a really similar thing Hmm. about what it takes to become a freelance writer on Upwork. They're too related for it to really make too much sense on a website. So we might want to include that in an FAQ page. And maybe I only talk about it for a hundred or 200 words under that question, but it's still an opportunity to help build the overall strength of my website from a search engine perspective. That makes sense. And I guess what I'm wondering is, depending on how narrow your niche is, I guess, it's going to influence how many different keywords you need to go after. Yes. And I'm wondering, like, if you just have one, is that going to be enough? Or is it enough if you get lucky? Or do you really need to have freelance writing on Upwork, uh, essential tools for freelancers, whatever, like, like, how many different kind of things do I need to cover to get enough volume that it's going to make a difference? Well, for your static pages, you want to just target the types of services or products that you sell most often or that you're hoping to sell most often. So we don't want to have a hundred different sub pages that are kind of like variations on the same theme. So there might just be like a resource page that talks about landing jobs on Upwork. And then there's variations to different blog posts I've written. So that's my variable content that gets updated. I recommend that businesses post at least once a week on their blog anywhere from 500 to 1,000 words. And there you have a little more flexibility in how you come up with the titles and topics. I think questions and lists are a great approach to take for someone who's new to SEO. What questions would someone who is in your industry be asking? What misconceptions are out there about working with a person like you or about solving the problem they're attempting to solve, then you can target additional keywords. So we don't want to overwhelm people on the static pages, which are those ones that sort of stay the same. They're your services, they're your practice area page, they're your you know core offerings. But then on your blog, you can be a little more creative. And then you can also link between the two. So when I'm writing a blog that's perhaps about you know uh, creating a profile on Upwork, I might link that static page that I have about what it takes to, you know, apply to Upwork or what type of freelance writing jobs are on Upwork. I might link that to my blog because it's related content. That's another great way to build your search engine optimization without feeling like you need to have dozens and dozens of sort of static non-blog pages. Got it. Okay. So basically we're going to take what we know people care about, what they're worried about in, in whatever niche we're in both solving their problems and how to hire people to solve their problems, whatever those might be, generate a set of a small set of core static pages and then a weekly blog post, which doesn't necessarily have to be Shakespeare, right? It has to be decently written and, and interesting, but basically our prospects and our visitors are already telling us what they want to hear about. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And we can also talk about things that are related to what your core offering is, but are not directly aligned. So to go back to that example of the sneaker or the tennis shoe company, yes, at the end of the day, I'm trying to sell my line of tennis shoes, but I might also talk about, you know, what are the best foods to eat before going on a run? Right. So I'm not, you know, I'm not telling, like, I'm not always talking about shoes. I'm talking about other content that my prospective readers are interested in. And if I get to throw in a plug at the end, like eating the right food is just as important as wearing the right socks and shoes for your run. Like, that's great because I can link to other pages on my website. But it is more about showing that you are a place to showcase consistent resources for your prospective readers that are helpful for them. 
Got it. And presumably, if we're in whatever space we're in, we care about those things as well, right? If we're a running junkie or a tennis junkie, we care about both the shoes and the diet and the whatever. Exactly. So it, I call that complementary content. It's not directly aligned to what my readers might be speaking about or the problems that they have. And that's why it's on a blog versus that static page on your website. But it's still an opportunity for you to put yourself in front of your prospective customers and to and to say to Google, hey, we update our website. Look, we keep adding really well-written, high-quality content that our readers are interested in, either directly or as a side interest. And I think that works really well. And then it's also a nice excuse to, to send some content to your newsletter, right? Like, Here's something that you're going to care about if you care about tennis. Absolutely. And it's also perfect for social media. So you're continuing to establish yourself as, you know, not just, hey, I'm a business and I sell something, but hey, I care about you and I care about your problems and I have the same questions and concerns that you do. And my website is a resource hub for all of the concerns you have over XYZ. Got it. So this is content on our site. What about uh, putting content on other sites like YouTube or getting backlinks from other sites? How important is all that other stuff that we don't have as much direct control over? I think what you can handle in your schedule is what you should take on. So one of the most common mistakes that I see people make is they go all in with content marketing and they're like, great, now I have to have you know, a YouTube, I need to launch a podcast, I need to write you know, two blogs per week, we need to be writing mm-hmm. content, sharing it on LinkedIn, pinning it on Pinterest. And it's like, guess what, you can keep up with that for about one week. And then you're going to be so burned out and exhausted, and you'll get results from none of it. So choose where you can be most effective. If you're a great communicator verbally, and that's how you tend to sign clients, maybe starting a podcast would make sense for you because people can hear your voice and how you talk and how you address different things in the industry. But if you write really well, being a writer and content marketer might be the better approach to take. So choose something that feels doable for you, something that will really fit in your schedule that you can keep up with. Because I think spreading yourself too thin doesn't really do you any favors. That's a great point. And I think it's also, uh, I call it the Oprah Media strategy. She basically produces content once and then disseminates it through all these different channels. So if you're a great writer, you can write it. Maybe you don't feel comfortable on video, but you can hire somebody who's got a nice voice, who wants to be on video to to read it onto YouTube and put some effects on there, or vice versa. If you feel really comfortable talking, you can talk and throw that on YouTube and, and pay somebody on Upwork or whatever to transcribe it and turn it into a blog post. Yes, you can multi-purpose your content. So even better if you can do that. You know, if you're going to record the podcast Maybe you decide, you know, once or twice a month, I'm also going to do this as a video and I'll just record myself talking or me interviewing a guest and then we'll throw it up on YouTube and we'll take the transcript and turn it into a blog post or to a, you know, question and answer series on the blog and, you know, produce snippets for social media as well. So if you can get more mileage out of one piece, that can also help. That makes sense. I'm glad we're not doing that today. I'm, I'm, as I mentioned earlier, yeah. I haven't shaved. <laughs> Uh, and I, you know, I got so excited to have you on here. I didn't mention what I have in my glass. I've got some Shannon Ridge uh, Petite Syrah. Oh, nice. A uh, little bit of a departure for me, but very velvety, very nice. I like it. Um, yeah. How's that sangria treating you? It's excellent. You know, I like to joke that it's the way that I get my serving of fruit, but I don't know <laughs> if fruit that's soaked in sangria is like, you know, government approved for the food pyramid and all of that. But that's my half my excuse anyways. Well, I feel like doesn't that double up the antioxidants or something? I'm going to assume yes. <laughs> I mean, there's no other explanation possible as far as I'm concerned. So, <laughs> right. <laughs> all right. So, so you mentioned fitting things in your schedule, which I think is super important. Uh, I know I've gone through several cycles of boom or bust, like, oh yeah, I'm totally going to do all this stuff. And then like you say, I get burned out and then I don't do anything. And then it's like, it's the worst of all possible worlds. You get all the stress and none of the results. And so, so that's super helpful. But what should people do? Is it worth, if people have time doing some kind of outreach or trying to generate backlinks or guest posts or other things that, that involve content that's not actually on a site you control? So I know a lot of people are really big into the world of backlinks. However, you have to do so many of them for that strategy to be effective that if you don't have the time to carve out and so much of that is out of your control, right? Unless you've hired an agency to do it for you, 
where you're going to have to keep track of, okay, did I reach out to this person and ask for a backlink? Like, did they provide it? Like, you know, if they didn't, why not? That it can take a lot of time and get you very little benefit. So I think that sometimes it can be helpful, but I wouldn't make it a major goal of your content marketing strategy. It always feels to me like there's so much about that process that's out of my control. You know, I can have an excellent written blog post, but you know, they just don't like my email that day or they've, you know, had five other people email them about backlinks. So it, it's not something that I would make, you know, the core of your marketing strategy. If you can get it great, but honestly that you have to have all your other elements in place for it to work too. Right. So if my website loads really slowly, if my website is ugly, if I don't have ways to capture those leads, it doesn't matter if I get a backlink. So you kind of need to have your marketing game otherwise on point to even be able to leverage that. And there's also no guarantee that someone who reads that blog post will click over to your site anyways. Sure. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm all for actually having a conversion mechanism as listeners know, once people actually get to your site, Um, And I think the other thing about the backlinking stuff is so much of it feels so scammy. I get a lot of requests for Mm -hmm. random people like, hey, can you put this thing about fashion on your business blog? And I'm like, yeah, why? Why would I do that? And unfortunately, those type of people and I get those too. I got like four this morning and sometimes they're relevant. And other times, like you said, it literally has nothing to do with what you're talking about. And it's like, I don't really want to turn off my audience by linking to stuff that is irrelevant and doesn't make sense for them just so you can get a link and I can say, look, I'm connected to another website. So again, that's one of the reasons I feel like that strategy is not as effective as perhaps it used to be. I think linking in your own website. And then also like if you write a blog and you can link to another high quality website as the source of your research, especially if that is something that is perceived as very high value. So a .edu, a mayoclinic.com, a .gov website. If, if I can link to that when I'm writing in my blogs, it helps show like, hey, Google, please associate me with these other highly ranked highly reputable websites. But I think that's more effective than trying to get your site listed, you know, on someone else's site just as a backlink. So Google will take into account your outbound links in assessing its quality score. Yes. So anytime you have the opportunity to show that you have done your research about a particular thing and you're linking to that website and it makes sense. So some they'll like that a lot more. So one great example is I, I work with a lot of attorneys to create SEO friendly pages. So when I'm talking about particular types of injuries, I am looking for hospital web pages. I am looking for information from the Cleveland clinic. I'm looking for CDC studies on, you know, how many kids suffer in car accidents every year because it helps to bolster the site that I'm writing for. If I can say, here's a piece of information that is only one small part of my blog, but I'm showing you that it's accurate and it's not just me pontificating or sharing my opinion. It's an actual outside, you know, insight from a study or something like that that I found. And what's interesting to me about what you're saying is as a reader, I care a lot about that as well, right? When I'm assessing the quality of the page, never mind what Google thinks. Yes. And that's who you want to be writing for anyways. You know, it's, I like to think of SEO as the secondary goal when creating a piece of content, because if I drive traffic to my website, but the content doesn't help my reader, I wasted time because that person is going to leave my website and go to one of my competitors. So if I'm not accomplishing both goals and making the reader be the one that's the priority, then I'm losing out on sales anyways, because I don't just want traffic to my website. I want traffic for ideal clients who are intrigued by whatever I have to say. So it is about so much more than just driving somebody to click to your website. We want them to land there and ideally stay there and take some sort of action. So it always needs to be reader first. And ideally be the kind of action that actually leads to business for you and not just somebody who calls you up and is a tire kicker and is never going to give you money and is going to waste a bunch of your time. Yeah. Right. That's even worse than if they bounce off the page in the first 30 seconds. Absolutely. And that goes back to, you know, how do we disqualify them as well? How can we learn enough information about them to where it doesn't feel invasive to the person who's landed on the page, but to where we can also tell, like, I don't want to do 20 minute discovery calls for somebody who's not right to coach with me one on one. So I'm going to do everything possible to disqualify them from taking up my time on a phone call before scheduling so that I make sure that every time I am on the phone, it's someone who is most likely the right fit. 
And this kind of goes back to what you're saying at the beginning of if if you are this, 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 and this, and not that, 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 and that will be a good fit. Yes, absolutely. Okay. So I think this is a lot simpler than than I thought it was, <laughs> but it still seems like a lot of work. How much time do people need to carve out sort of, I know you said fit it to your schedule, but I'm guessing if someone has five minutes a week, they might as well just forget about it, right? Like yeah. kind of what's the minimum viable schedule to do some level of effective SEO? Um, it depends on how much you're going to be posting. You know, you need to be posting on your blog at least once a week. Of course, there's going to be some startup time invested there. If you don't have a website or in listening to this podcast, you've realized you need to revamp your website. So that's going to be a separate project in and of itself. I don't even do mine weekly. So I batch mine to be bi-weekly or monthly. That way I can be sure to get it done. So I might sit down during, you know, one hour of of part of a month and say, I'm coming up with all the titles for my blog and podcast this month, uh, or for this particular client, I'm going to brainstorm all of their topic ideas during this particular time. And then I'll co- go back and create the content later so that we're kind of always ahead of schedule. But I would say, you know, if you're not even willing to carve out like two hours per week to work on SEO, you can still start incorporating it into your website, but is it going to make a difference? Probably not. And people who are really successful with it are those who are investing even more time. Got it. Okay. So two hours a week, you got to be able to commit to that. And that includes actually writing the content. Yes. Which is a non-zero amount of time if you're creating quality content, I presume. Exactly. Now, do you have a checklist or a calendar or anything that kind of demonstrates your process? Like, hey, sit down here and come up with the titles and then here, write the content or anything like that? Um, I don't have a checklist like that because it's been very much personalized to me. So for some people, that might feel overwhelming to say, I'm going to do this once a month or once every two weeks. It might be easier for them to say, you know, listen, I literally only do have those two hours a week. So I'll take 20 minutes to pick the topic and the rest of it to write, edit and publish the material. So figure out how your brain works. I knew that I would slack off on it or not be able to keep up with it if I didn't plan out that schedule of saying, all right, like, you know, it's too tiring for me to make like all of the process from beginning to end to come up with the title and then write it and edit it. But if I break it out into, you know, come up with the title and then outline it and then write it and then send it off to someone else to be proofread there, I've got some accountability built in there. So it's about knowing yourself and what you can keep up with. And if you think you want to do it weekly, put it on your actual calendar as a time where you're not reachable. Like you're busy during that time. That's when you create it. And then it'll pop up as a reminder and you know, you shouldn't have anything else scheduled then. So you can, should be able to switch over to that. And do it at whatever time, as you mentioned in your book, some people write very creatively in the mornings and some people are dead in the mornings and great in the afternoons or the evenings or whatever. Make sure it's at a time when your brain is going to be receptive to that task. Yeah. Always try to work things around what will work for you. One of the pitfalls I see in a lot of business today is people are like, oh, well, that works really well for that person. Well, that person might be a night owl or that person might be somebody who needs that accountability built in there. So know yourself, know what you can realistically keep up with for me, I don't want to carve out two hours every single week to work on one particular thing. So it's easier for me to take a whole day and be like, I'm brainstorming everything for the whole month. I'm passing it off to my team members to gather resource pages and data points that I might need and all of that. That's actually really good. It's funny. I have a list in my task manager. I have a list of blog post titles. And in theory, they're all sorted by order of when the next one's going to go. So I can just pull the top one off and write that, but it, I never keep it quite in the order that I want. So there's always like a little bit of extra finagling that has to go on in my mind. And I should really do a better job of just managing that list so I can just pull the top one and and write that and, and go. Because I find like once I've decided, hey, I'm going to write about this, it's usually not that bad because it's a subject that by definition I'm interested in. Mm-hmm. The hardest part is figuring out well, what should I be writing about? Yes. So that's a great idea that you have there to keep a spreadsheet or a list of the different topics and ideas. I I take everything. So I set up Google alerts to send me updates when there's been, you know, I write about car accidents and personal injuries a lot. So I want to know anytime that AAA puts out a new study about distracted driving. So I put distracted driving study, car accident study, CDC study. So it's automatically delivering me ideas to my email inbox. I also, anytime someone emails me a question that's been asked a lot, or if a client tells me, hey, this one page is ranking really successfully, I think, okay, what are the complementary 
things we can create around that. One of my clients was ranking really well for like a top 10 common causes of car accidents. I'm like, okay, so now we're going to do bike accidents, motorcycle accidents. We're going to do all these complimentary pages that we can link back to this core one and build on what your audience is already finding to be most interesting on the site as well. So whenever you do have ideas, dropping them into a list or something like that helps you because sometimes the well of inspiration runs dry and it's nice to have ideas in there. Right. That's a great point. So if I can summarize what you're saying, which I think is really liberating, it's basically figure out what your audience cares about, which you better freaking care about anyway, mm-hmm. uh, right? It shouldn't be a whole lot of extra work to, to know what your audience cares about and write great content for that audience that's going to be helpful to them. And don't worry so much about the billion things that might be helpful, but are outside of your direct control and are probably going to involve an investment of time and money and effort that you don't want to deal with right now. Yes. I think that last point is so important. So when you find something that you can just be consistent and high quality with, it is much better than saying, I'm going to do all 15 of these things on my to-do list regularly. And then I'll keep that up for about one month. And then I've confused Google because I've actually said, Hey, look, we publish content all the time. And then I burn out and can't do it for three months. So that's actually more detrimental. So if all you can post is once a week, then stick to that once a week. You don't need to post five or three times a week, but be consistent with it. I mean, that's been really helpful for me in a lot of different ways to just say, okay, I I only have to create one thing per week. I can do that. Like it's better to be slow and steady here and be very consistent and showing Google and my readers, Hey, here's what you can expect from me every week. There's going to be something. And as you said, you can take one day a month and write it all then and space it out and publish it at the right time. Yes. And, and I do that all the time. Like even recording my YouTube videos, I sit in my office and I change my shirt four times and I create four videos and then I upload them all at once. And my transcriptionist writes up, you know, the words that I actually spoke and it goes to someone else on my team to produce it in different ways. So that might only take me like an hour, an hour and a half, but it's like, I'm only asking my brain to do that one thing. It's like, okay, we are here to record YouTube videos. I can get it done much faster than saying, Oh, let me, let me drop 30 minutes a week on my weekly calendar to get that done. So sometimes you can be much more effective that way as well. That's a great point. And it's something that is really, uh, important for podcasters. And I kind of set myself up for failure there because if I do back to back to back to back podcast interviews on Sales for Nerds, it's, it's going to go badly by the end. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So you can burn yourself out. You can burn your audience out. Set the expectations for what people can expect from you. And sometimes if you over deliver and you're like, hey, I have two podcast episodes this week, or maybe I have this extra one, but I'm just going to hold it and drop it another week. That's fine too. But definitely set the minimum expectations for your audience so you don't feel like you're disappointing them as well. And if that's just one time per week, then you know, build that anticipation of, you know, every Tuesday something's coming out on my podcast or on my blog and just be consistent with it. But you do recommend that it should be at least once a week. That is sort of the bare minimum. If you're going to post once a month, you're probably not going to see the the same results as you would. And you can get away with posting once a week if it's longer content. So if you're going to say, I'm going to write a thousand or 1500 words, you know, that then you can get away with only maybe doing it once a week. Okay. All right, I better step up my game here on the content. I, I'm <laughs> I'm up to once a week, but I'm not at a. And one of my goals is to get more longer form content to be more in depth and comprehensive and so on. Yes, and not so much for Google, but more just to like really help people. I know when I read an article that really helps me solve a problem, I'm like, oh, this tends to be something that's really in depth. Yes, and sometimes your audience will like you more for that than doing like a surface level like four to 500 words where you don't really go into a ton of depth. But if you can hold their attention well during that longer form content and really go into detail about a specific thing, it helps to position you as an expert. It also sends all those great signals to Google that we want about what the page is about as well. That makes a lot of sense. Well, this has been super helpful. I want to make sure that I mention your book again, uh, How to Start a Freelance Writing Business. It is like, it's the practical guide from... Uh, you know, incorporation to finding clients to dealing with proposals to actually doing the work and setting up your schedule and managing your family's expectations. It really is the obviously the the work of somebody who has been through this all herself. And uh, you know, Sales for Nerds is all about saving people from my mistakes. And I feel like this is kind of the. It's almost like you wrote the book that you wish you had had when you were starting your freelance business. 
Yes. And if you've listened to this episode and thought, Hey, I really love creating content. Like I want to create something more than once a week, then perhaps writing for other people is a great way for you to expand your business and your income too. So that book might be helpful for you if you really do have a skill for writing and would like to do it for other people in addition to creating it for your own uh, webpage as well. That's a great point. And it's funny because I was reading this book and I realized that completely accidentally, I have a very small uh, freelance writing business on the side because I spend time with my clients helping them with content. And half the time, people are just terrified of writing. And we have a conversation and they're like, oh, that sounds so great when you say it. And I'm like, well, I'm just really just giving your words back to you. And they're like, I will pay you. Can you write that up? And I'm like, sure. Because to me, it seems pretty straightforward. And they're like, oh, wow, this is great. You know, I've been struggling with this language for years and it never sounded quite like this. And it's all stuff that they've just told me that I've kind of just edited and, and polished up a little bit. And I was like, oh, I never thought of it, but I have a, a side freelance writing business. How cool is that? Yeah. And that's what I love about freelancing. You can make it work as little or as much for you as you would like. So you don't have to be full time with it. You can have one or two clients or you can have 10 or more. You know, it's really something that is up to you. But if you have a gift for writing and if, especially if you do learn some of the elements of SEO and your own website is starting to rank, that's a very marketable skill that other companies are interested in as well. That's a great point. And there was one nugget in there that I thought was just so helpful for freelance writing, but any kind of consultative service business where you talked about, I don't remember the exact phrase you used, but you're something like the deadlines that you commit to are up to you. Mm -hmm. Yes. You know, and where else can you get that kind of benefit, right? Like when you work in a traditional office, your boss is going to tell you when something is due. My clients, sometimes they'll tell me like, hey, I need this by Friday. Is that possible? But I still have the opportunity to come back and say, yeah, I can't really do that. Like I'm busy or it's going to take longer than you think. So setting those deadlines will be helpful for you if you start writing your own content too, because you'll realize how long does it take me to research and write this and edit it? And then you'll be in a much better position to sell it from a business perspective. Yeah. And I feel like when I was starting out consulting, I took deadlines as something that people gave me. Yeah, And obviously there are hard deadlines in places, but I always have the right to say no or to try to figure out some alternative solution that's going to work for the client. Like you say, it's not like the boss says, have this on my desk by Friday or don't leave the office. Yes. And I think so many people, one of the mistakes they make is assuming that people need things as quickly as it would be theoretically possible to produce them. Yes. And then you make a bunch of commitments that, you know, if anything is not 100% perfect, you're going to be late and stressed out, even if the client doesn't actually care. Yeah. And having that, that one little phrase of the deadlines that you commit to are up to you is so helpful. And I, regardless of whether you're in the freelance writing business, just in case you're not and you don't buy the book, I want you to take that phrase and, and take it to heart. Yeah. Don't try to push yourself to do something, whether it's just you know a goal that you have in your business or whether it's a project that's due for somebody else. You do have the opportunity to have some say over that. And if someone does come to you and say, hey, I really need this done fast, great. Add a rush fee onto it. Like If you want to even take it at that pace, you can add an additional fee to say, yeah, I can do this, but I'm going to charge you however many extra dollars because I have to put a rush on this and push back some of my other projects that are going on. And you can also always just say no. What I've found most of the time is many people respect anyone who's doing a sort of creative process. So if you're an artist, if you're a writer, if you're a designer, nine times out of 10, they're going to ask you, is that feasible? Or when do you think you could have this back to me? Because they recognize that a lot of creatives and artists, they work on their own schedule and they work in their own way. And three days might be enough for one person, but not enough for somebody else. So remember that you often have that negotiation tool. And if you don't, you can decline or you can accept it and add an additional fee. That's a great point. And if you're doing that with all your clients, hopefully you're kind of batched up and, and you have some slack in your schedule to accept those rush jobs if needed. Versus if you're committing everything down to the to the last possible minute that you have freely available, you never have any free time. Yes, absolutely. Well, Laura, thanks so much. Uh, thanks for introducing Sangria to the podcast. I don't think we've had anyone do that yet. I <laughs> uh, really appreciate your time. And once again, the book is Start Your Own Freelance Writing Business coming out, what is it, July 16th? July 16th, yes. And look, uh, stay tuned to the Sales for Nerds website. We're going to be doing a promotion where we give away a whole stack of signed books books from Sales for Nerds authors, including this one. So uh, stay tuned for more on that. Thanks, Laura. Cheers. Thanks. Have a friend who'd benefit from this episode? Pass the word along. Have a friend who wouldn't benefit from this episode, but you haven't talked to in a while? Give them a call. 
Of course, iTunes reviews are great for getting the word out and also for helping me make the show that you want. So if you've got topics or guests that you want discussed on the podcast or in the apparently upcoming Sales for Nerds book, let me know. And if you want to automate client acquisition, turning more web visitors into leads, leads into conversations, and on to close deals while helping you stay in touch with the people who matter, check out memorand.com. That's www.mimiran.com. And once again, thanks for listening.